Imagine a vibrant discussion between people that includes both openness and critical thought in the pursuit of truth. The Purchasing Truth Podcast is an experience, a journey, an exploration of the impact that negative messages in politics and the media have on our families, community, society, and nation. Join your hosts, Bill Sterling and Tom Hazard, to discover new concepts and language strategies that will reveal effective ways of establishing truth. This podcast series will tackle current events, leadership challenges, healthcare confusion, integrity in business, and many other areas that affect us all. Gain clarity and understanding of the various truth perspectives. Welcome to Purchasing Truth. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to Purchasing Truth. I'm Tom with your host, Bill Sterling. And, you know, Bill, there's so much going on in the media on a daily basis or in the, our, our culture and our political world. There's so many things we could talk about each day. But one jumped out at me very recently, which is Joe Biden speaking at the Iowa State Fair. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. And he quoted, he was quoted as saying, and I think there's so many things to read into this, but he's quoted as saying, talking about the Democrats, he said, we choose unity over division. We choose science over fiction. We choose truth over facts. And it's the truth over facts that I I think I was half asleep when I saw this on my news program. And then I like perked up. I'm like, what was that? Rewind that. <laughs> so that's a good one, Tom. That's a good one to rewind. I guess the 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 challenge is because we've uh, I mean our whole podcast is all really about how to deal with truth, right? Right. And then for him to put facts and truth in some kind of polarity to them, and which is we've done so many wonderful podcasts, and this is for people to go back and listen to about a thing called truth perspective and. Yeah, it's kind of a partial truth, but it's really a belief that might be outdated or a belief that we have more evidence around. And so, you know, uh, truth uh, uh, versus facts is not a really good, uh, you know, um, polar uh, polar thing, two things to set in opposition with each other because they can't be. They, They have to have a relationship with each other. Truth and facts have to have a relationship to each other, some relationship to each other. You know, so that's the that's a big challenge. You know, you know, when I first heard him say this, I thought it was another Biden gaffe. I mean, he he is kind of prone to tripping over his words, misspeaking here and there. He had another unfortunate um miss it was it was not truly a belief of his, I'm sure. Uh, it, but it was a, he misspoke when he, you know, was comparing, you know, poor kids to white kids when he meant to say poor kids to rich, rich kids. kids. Yeah. So that was clearly just misspeaking on this one. I wondered it. I thought it was misspoken at first, but apparently not. He really was trying to put truth and facts opposite each other, which doesn't make a lot of sense to me. It doesn't. I and uh, and under in further, you know, further discussion about this. Uh, as time goes by, he's going to. They're going to figure out how to. Uh, you know, spokespeople are going to try to put cover around that because it's it's just too. Uh, it's 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 a longer discussion about the relationship between tr- truth and facts. And regrettably, you know, unless they got, you know, the skills I got, you know, about how to to parse what truth is and also to stay in a place of curiosity about what is factually somebody is stating a belief and is a fact. Well, how do you know if it is? And and this is where uh, Trump has done a tragic, wonderful job of being able to claim truth by just holding the megaphone up to the things he wants and no detractions for the things he doesn't want to clean up. He is a kid going through the aisle of a toy store and pulling the toys down and he keeps walking and everybody else has to clean the toys up. 
Wow, that's a incredible <laughs> mental picture. <laughs> it is. He's the toy guy. I mean, hey, look at this toy. Isn't this great toy? Toss it on the ground. Hey, look at this other toy. And you know, like Mr. President, don't you see that that toy you took off the ground? Aren't you going to put it on the shelf? Now, now, the white nationalists. There's no, no such thing. Fake media. You know, fake news. You know, it's not truth. You know, don't believe it. This is rigged. And he takes another toy down. You know, and is that toy something he's serving to the base? Is the, Are the toys like for the white nationalists? Is that the idea? Well, the way to think about this is a exercise in sales and marketing. An exercise of here is something that is a shocking reward for the people who are loyal to me to believe. And this is the shocking reward and when you come back after co a commercial break there'll be something that's going to be revealed then after commercial break there'll be something else that's going to be revealed that is his training as a reality star he has to set it up and as a marketing and salesperson it's always about the reveal and it's not like the other newscasters don't do it too rachel maddow does it right after the meshes be right back it's called the hook in radio they do it right after the break after the commercial break wait till you see what's happening on the other side now on a scale of one to ten is it big yeah, you know it might not be but that's not what the body tells the person to do the person the tells the body to stay loyal to the radio station, stay loyal to Rachel Maddow, stay loyal to John, Donald Trump. Why? Because of the hook, the physiological hook that goes into it. So is this what you would call sort of the anticipation he's building and somewhat of the uncertainty where he always says, we'll see what happens. I mean, that's we'll one of his happens. biggest cliche phrases. That's correct. That's right. It's a, it's, I, I would like, I would like media to say, Oh, the president is using anticipation for what he, what he thinks is going to come next. And he's building anticipation that he might really have in it something. Gosh, really? I feel doubtful and skeptical that he does. See, they're allowed to do that and still be newsworthy. Gosh, I feel doubtful and skeptical he has a new medical plan. I feel doubtful and skeptical there is something or otherwise we would be able to see something in writing. Gosh, you know, I, I really feel hesitant and nervous about the need for integrity being met with that statement. Now they're becoming a truth advocate instead of a responsive media uh you know reacting <laughs> response i almost called them call girls you know that was really too because there is a call girl principle in in alignment here tom you know the the you, you know the call girl principle have you ever heard the I, I haven't heard it said quite that way can you eliminate that for ha me happy to do the call girl or you know the prostitute regrettably they don't they get their money they get their money before the service is rendered not after okay because as soon as the service is rendered the value depreciates very quickly after an or <laughs> after an orgasm there's a the depreciation it's not all that valuable it wasn't that good the user might say no sorry we don't give refunds so you you pay before the reward is given because the idea of the value of the reward is yeah. often better than the actual reward is that fair? that's that's right there there there's a part of the payment there's a part of the anticipation the money's a part of it it's a type of bet it is a dopamine hit it is still a part of the create a little bit of dopamine by creating a reward Create a little anticipation. Here's the series of reveals. This is why packaging on a product is so valuable. It's a, it's a necessary reveal. Who wants to pick a screwdriver off the shelf? But if I pick a screwdriver that's well packaged, I can charge twice the amount for it. 
He's back to the marketing, the anticipation of the reward. I see. It makes a lot of sense now. Um, I didn't know where you're going with this cargo metaphor, metaphor, but I'll tell you what. <laughs> all of a sudden, I'm reminded, and this will be a very, very quick uh, little little uh, example here, but you ever see the movie Catch Me If You Can? Well, of course. Yes. And there's this great scene where Leonardo DiCaprio, who please plays Frank Abagnale Jr., uh, is in a hotel late at night, and across the hall is Jennifer Garner, this character played by Jennifer Garner, who is, in fact, a call girl. And they do negotiate the price as she's, you know, baiting the hook, setting up the reward, how much would it you pay for all night with me type of thing. And, you know, so they agree on a $1,000, which in the 1960s is just a huge amount of money. And... And then, of course, the funny part is that he pays for it with a, um, a a a bad cashier's check. So he's not really paying her money. But, <laughs> her money. but the, the, the perception of the reward is there. And uh, the, you're right. They do negotiate before the service is provided. So right. anyway, that's what, as you painted this picture that's what i saw it's all about the it's all about setting up the his narrative is all about setting up the um uh anticipation he's okay he is okay he is fine and good about putting his foot in dog poop he is okay about saying the wrong thing he knows it because he gets more mileage out of the cleanup because there's more exposure of him in the cleanup of what he just said, cleaning it up. When somebody has to fix something that you've said, they're still talking about you. One of the rule, one of the rules, Tom, uh, you might've heard this is bad media is just as good as good media. And yeah. sometimes it can be better if it's bad media than it is good media. It's, it's a, uh, this is a mistake and here's how we fixed it. Yeah. I think the way I've heard it is, you know, no press is bad press. No press is bad press is another, uh, you know, that's right. I mean, and that, that, um, you know, any exposure is good exposure no matter how bad it is. Right. It's huge. The reveal, the reveal, the anticipation, the uncertainty. I'm not sure how much it's going to be. These kinds of dynamics that are sitting here are playing out in media. And even the, um, uh, I was watching, um, uh, might have been Good Morning Joe or something. Uh, and uh, one of the military experts actually had it wrong too. He goes, you know, we got to treat this like a, you know, like there's an indoctrination here. This is the indoctrination. And then he said it and it was like, nope. He's going like, the way to do it is to call it out. No, it's not the way to do it is to call it out because all it does is entrench. Yeah, it gets people running back to what they, where they feel, you know, safe. And, yeah, I want to yeah. double down on my loyalty to this guy. I want to hang in. And, and every time the, the media is shaking, I don't understand why his points went up. Because you're talking it about it in a way that creates more anticipation instead of less anticipation. You're not soothing. And I'm going to say this, it's going to sound so bad. But the more you nurture and empathize, with the things that Donald Trump says, the less power he will have. That is absolutely counterintuitive, but I certainly believe it, Bill, with you know everything we've talked about in, in the multiple episodes that we have recorded and also my, my training with you over you know sales and communication. I mean, this is absolutely, I, I'm convinced you're right. Well, yeah, so Bill- because all the all the all the candidates are doing Elizabeth Warren, Kamala Harris, you know, uh, Pete Buttigieg stays out of the gets out of the corner quicker than most people do. Uh, you know, you know, Joe walks into it, gets paints himself in the corner, and what they don't realize, Bernie Sanders is they're repeating, they're repeating the mantra that that his people already know of him, instead of the mantra of what a leader needs to do. 
That's what's missing is that, yeah, we know you're where you stand. You're calling him a liar. What did you do that? The last 50 times I've seen you. Can you please give me a new message now? Yeah, I agree with you. I think Pete Buttigieg does the best job of, uh, ironically, as the youngest candidate, being the adult in the room and and leading as opposed yes. to just um, repeating the same sound bites or headlines yeah. over and over again. Well, let's let's circle this back. Let's come back to Joe Biden now. I mean, I think it's great sure. to sort of set up how that what the president does so skillfully and and so well, even though it to many people appears like a, a train wreck of leadership and, and it may very well be, but let's bring us back to Joe Biden saying we choose unity over division. We choose science over fiction. We choose truth over facts. So how is that communication not helpful to him? How is that sort of a tragic opposition of issues? There's three major things that are problematic. Number one, you're assuming you're listening to, you're speaking to people that are college age, you know, or post-college age to have those complex phrases all together. This is a Gettysburg, this is Gettysburg, uh, Gettysburg address moment, four score and seven years ago. You've got to talk to the people where they are. This is where they are. You can't talk to them where you've been. You got to talk to them where they are. Trump's good at that because that's what TV reality show is, is speak at the fifth grade level, speak at the 10th. It's not to say that the people that are listening are at the fifth grade level or have that mentality. No, no, no. There's plenty of smart people that got hooked in the same thing. But Joe Biden's best narrative is, is that leadership to me looks like integrity to me looks like and then just put a statement on the back end of it now he's got you know he's he's got something that he starts occupying the space i mean one of the things that barack obama did that separated him from the pack allowed him to run away with away from hillary very easily allow him to you know wreck with a with a with a name like that to get elected a name like that and he still got elected what did he do that was different he kept leading ahead of where everybody else was they were all the discussion was all about iraq 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 he just went the origin of this war started in Afghanistan. And here's the seven things I do, or five things I would do with Af Afghanistan. And really, this is where the fundamental part of terrorism is. And we're really not noticing that here. And he pivoted, and all of a sudden, the Republicans and everybody were clamoring. Same thing on the, on the bailout. You know, $700 million is a, a billion billion dollars is going to take care of this 700 billion i watched him walk across the senate floor come up the thing and said 700 this is what it's going to take to do it he knew very well that it was going to take another 300 billion but he knew he could get 700 700 billion and everybody had to follow that number the republicans couldn't bring it down the democrats couldn't bring it up to tell the truth but Guess what? Next, after he got elected and the $700 billion went to bail out the, the, the thieves at Wall Street and the banks that, that stole all the government money, just saying, that we had to prop all them up, just saying, <laughs> <laughs> while everybody else was sucking eggs, just saying, you know. And they were yeah. supposed to lend the money out. No, they put new tellers in. They put new uh, banks. They re redid their, uh, you know, their uh, ATMs. God bless them. You know. So, anyways, so um, the the main thing is pivoting and turning and standing, because if you get stuck, it's uh, talking about the 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 other the last story. You're 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 going to get dinged. You know, you're gonna well, get, you're going to then get stuck arguing facts. That's right. That's As right. we know, is you know, you can sit here arguing facts all day long, and you may very well be right about the facts, 
but you're not going to get anybody's attention. No one's going to care. So that's where this, you know, Biden arguing, we, we, you know, we believe in truth over facts. That didn't make any sense to me because yeah. you don't want to appear like facts are your enemy and truth is in opposition to facts. To me, that's almost like worse than what the media does, who's always focusing on fact checking, which again yeah. is not going to be a productive narrative. You know, that's, that brings up something really important, Tom. I'm really glad you brought that because if the media started scaling facts and started scaling perceptions on a scale of one to 10, it's about a seven. You know what? This is about a three issue. The numbers for this is this, yet the popularity of the belief is this. Then what would happen is, is that what we would, there would be greater trust in what the media is saying because they're coming down too much in a black and white world. It's almost like they need to offer the range of, well, you know, this is, this is what a blatant lie is, or this is on a scale of one to 10, this is really about a level three truth. It would be true to the people that are loyal and, and believe in him, but for the people that don't, it's more like a seven of an untruth. And start calling it truths and untruths, or partial truth and, and mostly true, or less true, and throw a percentage on it. And it would be know, very I think it would be very helpful. Actually, they'd be wise to get a hold of your truth scale that we talked about a number of episodes ago. <laughs> That's right. Can you That's imagine right. if they really understood, if somebody in the media understood and communicated this to a larger amount of the U.S. Uh, viewership, that where they then could point out, well, here you can see Trump's again calling him Sleepy Joe, so he's down here at label and diagnoses, and he's getting further away from truth. That's right. If, it, if that was part of the discussion, then those labels that the president is serving up on an almost daily basis would have much less impact. It would almost cease being newsworthy. Yeah, and you could even empathize with uh, President <laughs> President Trump. Oh, Sleepy Joe, maybe the president might be tired or feeling fearful or anxious about uh, Joe Biden speaking up with such confidence. Yeah, what, it's like, what, whoa, what happened? What just happened there? <laughs> but, uh, well, he was. I mean, 90% of the speech was confident. There was two or three moments where the messaging wasn't right, and guess what? the media amplifies that or the alternate media amplifies that. And what happens is it starts to occupy the truth. A 10% gaffe will cover easily, easily cover a 90% perfection easily. Well, and that's where, and actually I, I think we're going to continue to see he, I think he is the tortoise in this race. Okay. But that's where I think we're going to continue to see mayor Pete Buttigieg continue to rise, whether he gets the nomination or not. I don't know. Remains to be yes. seen, but he is definitely someone that, that is much more skillful in how he talks about things. Yes. He does have some of those like, whoa, what just happened here moments. He doesn't get stuck in the labeling and diagnoses in particular that you see other candidates. He doesn't. Saying if somebody asks him, do you think the president is a racist? Watch what he, how he answers and pivots where, you know, he talks about, he doesn't say it exactly like you do that. Well, yeah. we need to have a, a president that, you know, has more respect for different cultures and respect looks like this or respect might look like this, but what he's saying, it kind of gets there. It's, it's, it gets there. It gets yeah. there. And there's an inclusion piece that he uses often, which is refreshing too, is that you can't make an enemy out of somebody that you're trying to eventually win over or eventually doesn't become, it's like, just to put this out there, 
it's just like a, a disgruntled uh, employee coming back to an uh, upset you know thing and doing something terrible coming back to a work site you sort of want to leave the relationship where it ends in a very clean way you don't want to to let let it end in a way that is going to allow the person to ruminate violence because um, and what the violence is is really just they become an advocate for the opposite side and they don't need to be because Tom you and I both know how to extend mutual respect to each other yes good I'm guessing within a very short time if if we're including the worst of the worst, we can still see the person's humanity yes. in the tragic behavior that they say and do. Yes. And I, and I can also see areas in which, you know, people I disagree with on many levels can have areas of, of common ground. I, you know, I can, I can see the, the potential there. I, I think very interesting what you're saying here. It sort of seems like you're saying, you know, having empathy and showing some respect for the, the people, some compassion for the people you disagree with allows them to come, come back later. And whereas the way others are speaking, it's kind of like back to the Hillary and the deplorables comment that really what it did in effect is burned a bridge between other, uh, you know, a large portion of American voters to the point where they, much as they maybe didn't like President Trump, they could not see themselves following Hillary Clinton. Yeah. And that, she, that was a bridge she burned so that she made sure they didn't. John Kerry had one of those moments. Uh, not Kerry. Um, oh, boy. Mitt Romney had one of those moments where the guy was videotaping him. The, 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 oh, the, the was 47%. Video. 47%, you know, like, yeah, he was, he was, he got one of those moments and that, yeah. that, that moment, you know, swung, you know, 10, 15% of the vote away from him because, you know, we're, you know, we're a Republican and, and you're just talking to the rich part of the Republicans and that's all you're really here for. So. Well, and, and turned off people that might've been in the middle and might've come his way where I think he said, you know, 47% of Americans are dependent on government in some form. I mean, that was paraphrasing essentially what he said, right? Yeah. And of course, Republicans in general are supposed to be the smaller government, anti-government, whatever, not anti, maybe it's not the word, but yeah, small government small party. Government. And they don't like, people being dependent or the idea of people being dependent on government, but you've got an awful lot of conservative voters out there. So disheartening. They're, they're so benefit from the government. And so that turned people away. Most people, there's so many, so, so much of support that the, so many of, of the social service support that our government provides <laughs> goes to ex-military people and every time they talk about the you know the handout folks and this thing something like you're talking about the military folks that that have served the country and they you didn't leave them off at the end with a good job you didn't leave them off better you just basically stuck them back into society and said well fend for yourself and i don't know Here's a little bit of food, but it's not going to last too long. You know, it's like, oh my gosh, it's like the one of the lowest integrity things that, regrettably, our government slash and or Republican colleagues do is, you know, cut those interpersonal, those social service pieces all the way back to, you know, kind of, you know, Reagan, you know, and all the gutting he did to put all the homeless people on the street. I mean. He started it. I mean, and there was a time, there was a time in 1970, uh, like uh, the, in the uh, late 70s, where there wasn't any homeless, well, and any is too sweeping, but the, the food was being distributed to the shelters in such an efficient way that people weren't hungry. There was like a really low percentage of people because 
food. Now 40% of the food we make, we throw away. What kind of noise is, what kind of noise is that? Well, and it doesn't Silly. always get to all the people that could use it. I mean, there certainly are. I mean, I, I have personal experience with the Orange County um, Second Harvest Food Bank, and yeah. certainly they're doing a lot here in Southern California to distribute food to those that need it. But there is a tremendous need. Is the tremendous point? The um, you know, there's a you know, all all just a small shift, small shift. So you got to make it mandatory, mandatory that uh, food that uh you know food that is expired or moving out you got to make it mandatory that it needs to be distributed to these people and it, it would start getting there but it's not mandatory so it's cheaper for them just to throw it out of course anyway mm. tom we got a lot uh, a lot of truth issues to, that we need to work on don't we <laughs> always it seems yeah i mean this it is and this is a good yeah these are good fact pieces and and this is why the facts versus uh truth is not a it is not uh, an equal sentence. It is, here is, you know, here is the fact, and even you and I, you know, talking about homelessness and or things, all I got to do is put one or two globalizing words and the argument will come like a fire, fire uh, flame, flamethrower at me. All homelessness, all, if I do an always, a never, uh, should, shouldn't uh, immediately the, the flamethrower is going to come in my direction because um, they'll find the 1% that it's not true and say, see, you know, it's like, yeah. So, yeah. Uh, and so then the, the, the proportionality of everything gets lost because yeah. you, you know, if all of a sudden now if I find one fact that actually is in opposition to that sweeping statement you made. Now it questions the whole thing. The whole thing. So climate change gets to be thrown out, even though two percent of the people, you know, say it's a hoax. <laughs> so, uh, what the heck is that noise? And all right, yeah. So this is this has been a good one today, Tom. So next time, next time, I think we want to take on a little bit about how the criminal system needs to restore trust and truth, and what does a truth message, uh, what's the cost of a truth message? If you, if you go with the truth, then what is the cost? If, uh, uh, and there's a lot, of, um, a lot of problems that we have in our system of people hiding things because they're, they don't want the truth to come out. Ooh. And so because they hide things, then the truth, the truth gets stuck. Because they're they're not interested in truth, they're interested in protection. Well, I'm interested to discuss about discuss that. I, I think in in context with perhaps the president's income tax returns. Yes, doesn't yes. that fall into that uh, protection yes. message? It is a protection message, and it's also one of the things that he's done a wonderful job of planting seeds of doubt inside his loyal loyalist his voters mind that it's no big deal i've always been a rich guy uh this is the way it works i've been audited i got audited many times the audits aren't always right they're always changing the numbers yeah. you know it's a big deal it's all the same you know shell game of anticipation that he plays you know? wow all right well talk about baiting the hook for next time yeah, that's a good one, man. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Tom, it's a lot of fun. Thanks. I had a great time. Thanks, Bill. Right. Take care. Bye. Thank you for listening to this Purchasing Truth podcast. We trust that you have enjoyed this engaging and thought-provoking conversation. Our hope is that you've received value, found clarity, and broadened your truth perspective in this episode. If you did, leave us a review or visit our website, PurchasingTruth.com. Join us again for another informative and content-rich discussion here at the Purchasing Truth Podcast. Don't just accept whatever information comes your way. Join the discussion. Discover your own voice. Purchase your own truth.